Welcome to the Bias Buzz. I'm Don Irvine. He's Brian McNichol. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you. How was Louisiana? It was beautiful. It was warm down there. It was some, some highs in the 80s while we were there, which is not. Everybody thinks, well, of course, it's Louisiana, but it's been very cold there at Christmas. But this was a hang around outside, get to play with the footballs as soon as the kids get them and so forth. And you went to a bowl game, so went that was to, good. Went to the Independence Bowl, saw uh, Vanderbilt, North Carolina State. A um, lot of Vanderbilt people there, not quite as many North Carolina State, but it was a good time. It was good. And uh, your, your <coughs> LSU team uh, had a good game. You had a good game. We shut down the Heisman Trophy winner, won 29-9. Um, a lot of hope going into next year. We got our coaching staff, our two coordinators. We're all fired up. No, that's good. All right. It's uh, <laughs> also along the football line, so we also have the national championship game coming up. We had the playoff uh round this past weekend and uh, I guess there are not a lot of tears being shed for Ohio State getting mauled you know uh, there was a uh, if if the case can be made against a playoff it that it was made by Ohio State right those they didn't belong there they lost to Penn State Penn State won the conference championship Penn State went out and played a heck of a ball game and lost on the last play of the game Ohio State didn't even show up against uh, Clemson had no business being there to start with. Um, if we're going to do this as, you know, it's all settled on the field, then you can't have a team lose to Penn State and then go in front of Penn State, right? So it's, sa it's the same old beauty contest, and if the beauty contest is going to give us, you know, a team that can't even score a point in the game, then, you know, I, I think we got it wrong, and I think that, you know, some serious looks need to be made at how we're picking those teams. All right, one more thing on this playoff. Uh, so Lane Kiffin is now out. D what yeah. do you think about the effect of this for the game? Um, I, I think Sarkeesian's been at it all year. It won't be a big effect. I think uh, they got tired of putting up with each other. You could, they clearly were not liking each other. I saw a thing <laughs> on ESPN at the end. You can see the highlights of them like talking to each other. And the, all the clips was like uh, uh, Saban's like, <laughs> you know, you can't see what he's saying, but you know he's angry, you know. Yeah, I'm glad so. they don't, they're not mic'd. Right? right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, our national day trend today is National Spaghetti Day. Pretty good day. I, I am honoring this one. I'm going to make spaghetti tonight. I have a good spaghetti recipe. I, I should, I know my wife isn't watching, mm -hmm. but maybe we, I su should suggest that for tonight's dinner or something yep. like that uh, before we head out of town this week. All right, so now let's go to some of the, n the news of the day. So the big news story is actually about the news, and it's about Megyn Kelly. So Megyn Kelly has now officially bolted Fox News. She's going to be working for NBC News. This is a big deal. I mean, there are stories everywhere about this. It's not necessarily a big surprise because there had been speculation for months, we, knowing that her contract was up this year, uh, that she might leave. She was looking for not necessarily more money, but a higher profile platform and some other things along the way. Uh, you know, Fox News, you know, definitely threw a lot of money at her. Was She was making like $15 million a year now. They were offering her 20. Reports said that, you know, she even asked them for 25. But I don't think it was really about the money. It seemed that it was really about her family time and getting a chance to do other things that weren't going to be necessarily in the evening all the time. Right. And, and um, she's a very capable person. Um, she's a very good reporter. She has a relationship with uh, the president-elect, unlike any other reporter. And, and, you know, the first thing, oh, it's negative. They fought. You know, he had a respect for her that he did not have for the media, right? So um, I, I think that the, uh, NBC did a good job. I think, uh, I think it's a good get for them. She'll be the most conservative person on a legacy over-the-air network since Cheryl Atkinson left CBS. Um you know, I, I think when you have like you'll she'll be on these panels and Joy Reid and the other regular suspects will be on these things, and they're used to saying abjectly, provably incorrect things, and no one challenges on them because it makes the other side look bad. And you'll have someone there who actually, you know, knows how to make the argument against it. Um, you know, it's not her job to argue for the conservative movement one way or the other, but I think that you will see less complete nonsense go unchallenged on those on that station yeah and I mean, she does actually you know <laughs> get any appearances on, on msnbc which is likely <laughs> because the way they use the the new side right. of that of the network uh I, i'll be fascinated to watch her 
get onto Chris Matthews or Rachel yeah. Maddow? Will they, you know, she's going to be part of the paid staff. You invite her on there. There could be some really epic uh, conversations and battles going on there because she is a very sharp person. Now, you know, taking a little bit of the other side of this too, though, this is, I think, there is some risk for, for Megan on this. She's been with Fox for 12 years. Uh, even though, you know, she is smart and I think she's a great interviewer and, and things like this. That network allowed her to make her star, and, and her stardom rose. You know, you take a program and you put it into the nine o'clock slot right after Bill O'Reilly, you're going to be guaranteed a pretty big audience lead. And now you have to hold it. You know, right. you stu- it's still up to you to hold it and, and to be able to do things. And, and she had the second most watched news program in cable news. Uh, you know, so she she leaves really kind of at the peak, you know, valuation for her. So that's a, that's probably a good strategic move, but. You know, her role at, at NSBC is going to be she'll do some of the political commentary, the breaking news, political commentary, things like that. That's definitely right within her, you know, her, her frame here, the things that she does, her strengths. On the other hand, developing a daytime show for her, that I see is a little bit tricky. And the Sunday evening news show could be interesting because, you know, it, it seems that you know, they're going to try to make it 60 minutes like and maybe run it up against 60 minutes. Uh, that's a tough franchise. Those, those, to that, that's against. tough. I mean, the daytime television thing is thing is is just that you know Anderson Cooper tried to get a daytime TV talk show. He flopped. Uh, you know, Katie Kirk is maybe the biggest flop in terms of going on to other things. She had a great gig at the Today Show, left it to anchor CBS Evening News. That was horrible. After her contract was up there, she went and she did a talk show for you know, basically Disney ABC, and that lasted two seasons. You know, she's running around here doing stuff for Yahoo News. Who watches Yahoo <laughs> News, right? I mean, so Think about Katie, Katie Kirk. Is, she's like, you know, whoop, she is to news what Whoopi Goldberg is to the movies. No one, you know, it looks like, hey, you know, you could plug her in all kind of stuff, but you really can't. And it's like there's been this search to find the right platform to put her on, and uh, they really haven't ever come up with it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I can <clears> see <throat> Megyn Kelly succeeding in daytime potentially – as long as she doesn't become this big entertainment, you know, her strength is not really doing the entertainment reporting, right. which is what daytime television tends to be like right. in a lot of cases. Right. So she'd have to kind of adjust and morph and do a lot of things in order to succeed there. But, you know, it, it's it's a start. We'll, s- we'll see where it goes. She will have a bigger platform. I mean, there are more people watch, you know, broadcast television overall than cable TV, at least on the news side. So. Right. But, but there's also, uh, you know, all Fox does is stuff like what she does. That's not true of NBC. They have this, all this other noise, you know, like, so she thinks, you know, you know, she may be drowned out by Hannity or O'Reilly, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that can drown you out at C- NBC. So I don't, she may she may go down in that area. Right, so it, the, the jury will be out. We'll watch very uh, in, you know, anxiously to see how she does with that. Uh, Let's move on to Donald Trump and some of the press corps there, too. So now Sean Spicer is in. Um, he's settling in to do these it's press conferences. Move, you know. I think it's a good move. And he's talking about maybe even using Facebook and Twitter to do press conferences. And Trump's first press conference is coming up next week. That's right. Um, and I, it'll be interesting to see how he does with that. Um, he is not going to sit there and endure the grillings, right? Like, you know, they're, they're you know, and you saw, like, uh, when Congress started back up yesterday, there was a thing about the the ethics thing, which needs to be fixed, by the way. Um, and you saw it was like the it was the old jackal appearance, you know, you know, you can't even organize a vote on this, and you guys want to run the country. And it's like that's a question from a from that was a question from an AP reporter, AP, which is supposed to be right down the middle, reporting the facts, right? Which but which has turned horribly to the left right um so you know, the, he um it's a whole new world out there and he's not going to accept the old world and he's not going to sit there and play gotcha with these guys you know it, it's good they'll get one bite of the apple and if you come in and ask good questions you'll get good answers if you come in and try to preen you're going to get called out yeah so i think you know it's it's <coughs> that whole new world order things are going to be very different we don't exactly know how different it will be in the end. We will have to wait and see uh, this. But, but the January 11th press conference could be at least a little bit of a window as to what's going to happen. Though I guess he's, 
he's supposed to going to answer these uh, ethics conflicts and things like that. I think mm. that's part of the main reason for doing it. Uh, the press is definitely chomping at the bit, and I think they're just very nervous about where the heck things are going with them. Right, because with the, because they always, you know, you think about this. If you've been doing this forty years, you've been reporting on the White House. You're Mark Noller, say. You know, it's gone a certain way the entire time you've been up there. It's about to go a completely different way. And you could be the big victim laying smoldering in the street, right? You can't, you know, it's not, you're not, it's not, may not be you get them. They may, the bear may get you this time. So you have to be careful about how you proceed. Right. And yeah, and, and, and Trump is basically a constant kind of a, a news machine because he's, right. he's this rapid tweeter. You know, we, I don't know that. He'll actually reduce all that that much. I, I don't mean, think he will. And I don't know that he needs to. I mean, I think he's shown, for better or for worse, that overall it probably has a, a, a positive effect uh, for him. I mean, people do follow him, and they do react to him, and uh, he gets to say what he wants to say when he wants to say it. And, and, okay, do you know what Obama was thinking about yesterday? Right. You do know what Trump was thinking about because he tweeted. He That's told true. you. So I don't necessarily need the New York Times anymore. Right? That's right. Right. He's told me what you know. What's the president working on today? Uh, ethics thing was stupid. You know. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever he says. Uh, but he, but you know w w what we want to know is what is he doing? What is he doing with the vote we gave him? What is he doing with that power? With Obama, it's like you know uh, we'll come out every three weeks and send you a press release this guy he's telling you every day this is what i did today this is what made me mad today this is what i thought was great today you know i have the information i need yeah this is almost like having a camera on him all the time without it being there and being yeah. turned on it's just that he's using twitter as a way to get that message out whatever his feelings are yeah. whatever the time of day is unfiltered Un yeah totally you know, unfiltered which is carrying a bunch of which is the way it should be. Which yeah. is the way it should be. Yeah. Okay, now, so Congress is now back in session, and it looks like they're going to tackle Obamacare. And, you know, what, what's your take on where we're going with this? Well, they Senator Enzi put it into a budget resolution, which means they, can, they get one chance to do it with 51 votes. They can take off whatever they want to take off from Obamacare with 51 votes. The sticking points are the leaving people on there until they're 26 which costs some money, but I, 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 I get that under the, you know, that's one of those things, you know, it used to be 18, the world's kind of changed. Okay. We want to do that as a, make that decision as a country, you know, you can sort of, it's not good, but you could live with it. But the other one is pre-existing conditions, um, politically stickier because people don't really understand the issue, but it's not insurance. If you can get on with pre-existing conditions. Okay, it's I'm going to pay you a little so that you can pay a lot for my medical bills. That's not the game. That's not what we're doing. And they have to fix that. They have to address it. And I think everyone realizes that the money pit cannot stop until that's fixed. But what do you do? And you're going to have to eat a little, you know, that's going to be a political beating for that. Yeah, and that that's that's a good point about the pre-existing conditions because you know that that's a that's a hallmark, a big deal that Obama, you know, they wanted to make sure the Democrats want to make sure was in there. But you know, if you're if you're the insurance company, it is an insurance because you cannot assess the risk for what you're going to do. How do you set rates when you don't really know what people's health really is? When you have to take them, no matter what. Which means is that yeah you may be paying and w and we saw this I mean we've seen this already is that the reason that these guys have been dropping out of exchanges and and they've been raising the rates is because these sick people are in here and it, the costs have just driven way out of line and so it, it's not a, it's not really the true risk pool for the insurance companies anymore they just it's kind of like it's unlimited and they've right. got to figure out how to price it and, and so they're they're trying to catch up and price it. But it, it is this never-ending game unless unless Congress fixes that and says we you know we need a better solution. But you know politically, yeah, you, people don't understand. And think, oh, why can't I be covered? You know, if I'm got an illness, what's the that, big deal? That's so unfair. But it's not, you know, the, the w insurance only works if some of the people don't get sick or don't wreck their car or whatever you're insuring. Right. right? It's some of it. It's got to work out for some people, right? Like I go to the doctor, you know, knock on wood, every like two or three years, whether I need to or not. But that's it, right? Um, uh, but the, but there are people. You, if you t if you have me, if you have a lot of me's, then you can have a few people who are, 
who are very sick and using it all the time. But if you don't have, if you're, you know, you don't have Mies, and what that happens is the Mies have said, uh, you know, it's cheaper to pay the penalty, right? So they just pay the penalty. So they're out of the pool. The health, it's not just that the, all the sick people are in the pool, but all the healthy people are out of the pool. You know? Right, right. And the younger people don't really see a need to be in the pool, and there really right. isn't a lot of reason for them. I mean, I have told younger employees over the years is that, in general, you can you should find cheaper alternatives to the health plans that we offer because, you know, when you're in an HMO, you're helping to pay for everybody else, uh, you know, on that whole thing. But you can probably go direct get a policy that's cheap on your own, take care of your basics because you're going to be younger, you're healthier. Uh, that's a low risk for the insurance companies. They're betting that you're not going to need their services. Therefore, you know, it's not good for an insurance company if, if they're paying out 105% of their claim money to take mm. care of everything there. You know, they're good if they're paying out 95% because then they're going to make money. Right. So, and they need to be able to do that. And if they can't make money and they go out of business, then who's going to provide the insurance? <laughs> who's going to provide the health care? So you know, it's, this, and it's this cycle that people have to understand how this works, and they really don't. Uh, all right, so let's let's move on. The other mm. thing that's become news too is that Sean Hannity's had these uh, exclusive interviews with Julian Assange, mm -hmm. and of course this just riles you know the liberals and the Democrats because you know the leaks, the Russians, uh, this is their number one target for uh, once again why they lost the election. Right, right, <laughs> and it was because they told us the truth. That's right. <laughs> we really <laughs> found out about you, and we're like, uh, no. Um, but but you know uh, they keep saying the um, Obama administration says it's. 100% sure the Russians hacked it, right? Uh, the uh, Assange says he's a 1,000% sure that they didn't. That's right. right. So <laughs> <laughs> he's 10 times more sure than they are. <laughs> but <laughs> but that was someone else's joke. I, I don't remember who, but I, I don't want to take credit for it. But, uh, but it does point out the thing. If the guy who received the information is telling you that's not where it came from, then why is that not weighed in? I don't understand what his incentive to lie is, right? At this point, you know, what does he care? And, you know, if, but if, he, if he's telling you unshakably that that's not where the information came from, why do we, you know, why do we keep on that point, right? Right. I mean, and he also was talking about the uh – the Podesta email. He said a fourteen-year-old could have hacked that. I mean, right. the guy apparently was using password as his password. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> hello, <laughs> that is so secure, guys. I was like, you know, and he, and he fell for the phishing scam. So, you know, once again, and, I, and, and how often do we have to agree or get to agree with Julian Assange? But he basically saying that you know, the Obama, you know, the Democrats, they are just they won't take blame, you know, for the, for this. They just won't accept the blame yeah. for the loss, and that this was why Clinton lost, why, what's happening, it's because of them. It's not because of the Russians. It's not because right. of Julian right. Assange. They didn't it's fix any votes. None no, of the votes are tied up to Internet. So you yeah. couldn't, like, go on your computer and mess with anybody's vote. Okay, w But what they did was they showed, a, showed them to be vapid, unresponsive people with, you know, with uh, bigoted views against Catholics, against people of color, against uh, Hispanics. You know that they were they were at least as bigoted as the people they were accusing of being bigoted. Oh, I like that vapid. That's uh, that's good. That'll be the word of the day, as Bill O'Reilly uh, would say. All right, Valerie Jarrett uh, <laughs> went out and said that there have been no scandals under Obama. I think this was news to a lot of other people. You know, um, uh, there were there were two scandals that uh, I think uh, rival any in the history of the republic. And they didn't get um, the one of them was uh, ch Operation Choke Point, where you're going to you're cutting off banking services for businesses, legal businesses you don't like. You're trying to run out payday lenders, gun sellers, uh, bullet makers. That was a big focus of the Obama administration is anybody who made ammunition. Uh, and you just said went to their bank and said, if you give them banking services that allow them to do business will lean on you that's thuggery that is outright thuggery and it should not be and the people responsible should be in prison for that the other one is the irs scandal again you're using the regulatory power of government to suppress political views you don't agree with i mean that's as bad as it gets those are the worst things you can do as a government official it's like you know bill clinton uh you know you had an intern in the Oval Office, blah, blah, blah. Bad, but, you know, in the big picture, doesn't hurt the country, right? Just, except from this, you know, 
slowing progress and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but this is a direct abuse of power turn using the power of government against its citizens. Right, and I th and I think part of the problem I have with what Jared is saying, I understand if if we're talking about something that was personal to Obama. I mean that he his he moral turpitude or something like that. I understand that kind of thing, but take responsibility, take some accountability for what happened under your watch. You know, the things that you described, even what, you know, Hillary Clinton's reaction in Benghazi. You can go down now, and I've seen a lot of long lists. Some of the things I, th I find to be a little, you know, from conservatives say, well, that's really kind of pushing, that's more more opinion than real fact in terms of what happened there. But the IRS, you know, choke point, I think you could, you could probably throw in uh, maybe, you know, part of that is fast and furious. Right. There's a bunch of things you can throw in that are legitimate things that happened under Obama's watch that were scandalous that he should need he should take responsibility for and it's like Valerie Jarrett saying uh, this didn't really happen it's not really it's not his fault you know he's he's just the right. president right. and then and then quashing all the law enforcement looking into it right right so the same thing okay so then we also have uh, something we've discussed before the democratic national chairman's race that's coming up the election is coming up i think at the end of february uh, you know, we've seen some change. So Keith Ellison still an, in the lead, I guess. Tom Perez apparently is giving him a run for his money, the labor secretary, the outgoing labor secretary. And then there are a bunch of others, uh, like from South Carolina, the state party chair, and I think New Hampshire. So the few others that are potentially in the mix. Uh, Ellison is no shoe-in, but he seems to be getting some of the endorsements in Congress. He's getting some interesting endorsements. Harry Reid was one of them. Uh, uh, he's getting, like, what, what, what you would call the mainstream you know, the establishment Democrats, right? Uh, Perez is getting, in, which may be a more volatile, more difficult to contain insurgency, Perez, who's a Montgomery County guy, um, <coughs> uh, is getting labor union support. He is l big lined up the labor union. Right. So it'll be a long time till it's over. The numbers are big on both sides. <coughs> yeah, and so, it'll, you know, from my personal perspective, I mean, I would love to have Keith Ellison in there as the chair because I think that only – continues that whole downward spiral for right. the Democrats. I do too. Uh, not that Perez is, won't drive him in the same direction because he's extremely liberal left as well, but I think Ellison is far worse for the party as a party right. leader. Than I think it's th a th terrible than optic. Yeah, than I Perez. That's yeah. he, uh, Ellison is more why you lost. Yeah. You know, uh, Perez sort of uh, harkens back to when you were winning. Right. Okay, <coughs> so, so now just a little Hollywood showbiz thing. So, so – now that Donald Trump is about to take uh, the Oval Office here, uh, we have Arnold Schwarzenegger has now taken over the Celebrity Apprentice. I didn't watch it, but I, uh, you know, he's now instead of you're fired, you're terminated. You're terminated. You're terminated. Get to the chopper. <laughs> yeah, get to the chopper. <laughs> get to the chopper. Uh, and he smokes a cigar. Yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but the but as I understand, <laughs> the, the the problem really for the show going long term is that the ratings were not very good on show number one. The ratings have been heading downhill for a while anyway. I don't know that Arnold's going to save this. Arnold may be the last. Guy. He may, they may terminate Arnold. Now, 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 uh, isn't it always with those things, though, that it's, it's lowest at the first, right? The first, the early part of the season is, you know, you have a million people in there, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of mayhem, and then they start eliminating people. And then when you get down to the, you know, people get a real emotional stake in it. Doesn't it go up? I don't know. I have, you know, that's a good point. I haven't actually watched for that. It's just, I think also the other part is that, you know, they they put that on Sunday night too, and there's a lot of stuff going on, yeah, and and yeah. so I'm not, you know, I, I it's almost as if it was counter programming to other things that were going on. Not a real serious thing that we want. We're going to set this aside. And nobody's home. Yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, and you know, if you if you want the to me, if you want the Celebrity Apprentice type of a thing to really take off. Then you take one of your stronger programs as the Christmas break is over and you put it right after it. You want your lead in so that you still got a few people hanging around then you build that and then gain some interest. I mean, I think Schwarzenegger's an interesting guy to watch probably to a certain extent, but you know, but he's no he's no the Trump. Thing about it is though, he's no Trump in an important aspect too. This is a show about uh, business, right? We don't really know Schwarzenegger as a business success story. Exactly. I mean, he's obviously you know, he did the power drinks and stuff. Right. I and mean, he's obviously made some money in yeah. his life. But, I mean, Trump, you think of as, you know, he's he's evaluating from you from the standpoint of someone who, you know, I've done what you did and succeeded. And I don't know that, that you have that with is as clearly defined with 
right. uh, Sh- Arnold. That's an excellent point because if you think <coughs> of the episodes I used to watch uh, on this is that when Trump introduced what the challenge was, he would talk about a Kodak or whatever, and he would talk about the iconic brand and all of these things, and, and you knew that he knew what he was talking about. You felt that he actually believed that because this is a business guy. Yeah, I'll say it, it, it was a key moment in the campaign, and uh, people I've written about this, but I can't get anybody else interested in it, but is during the last debate, they started talking about the Ford plant, right? Uh, he knew where that plant was and what it made. And she she gave her boilerplate, you know, protecting workers, this and that, fighting for this and that, you know. And he actually knew the specifics of it. And uh, I think a lot of people went, yeah, he does know what he's talking about. Yeah, so he shows a lot of good business yeah. acumen. I mean, so yeah. it'll be a little bit different. All right, so we're just about to the point. Let's go ahead and just do the two-minute warning now. Two-minute warning is, um, you know, that the uh, I was at the Independence Bowl. 28,000, the sports editor there was concerned about, uh, you know, when you s- – if you took the right picture, there were a lot of empty seats in the stadium. But it's a 50,000, 52,000 seat stadium. 28,000 is more than half full. Um, you know, you have a lot of things like uh, the uh, North Carolina State Band had 48 people, one major at there. Okay, so obviously that's a 300 member band. So, yeah, all those bowls are, are the bowls are in trouble, uh, but all of college football is. Revenue, uh, attendance is down 4%. Um, Western Michigan was, was kind of the darling story of the season, went undefeated until they lost to Wisconsin the other day. Uh, never came close to filling up its 30,000-seat stadium. So it was a challenge to get people, the, the students, to go to the game, to get people off there, out from in front of their uh, high-def TV to go to the game. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, and I think there's got to be a little bit of bowl fatigue at this time of year right. too. I mean, we have so many bowls now. We have so many bowls, and you have you've said only these two semifinals, and then the final matter. Count, right. Everybody else is just playing for fun. That's right. right. So if I'm playing for fun, do I want to you know go to Los Angeles and get a hotel room for the Rose Bowl to play for fun? No. If right. there's something on the line out there, in the old days, remember, everybody could you know win it on the last day and i think that that's what they need to look at right all right so in the time mm-hmm. remaining i just want to say that so fox news finished as the number one station in all of cable last year for 2016 a remarkable feat they beat espn they beat tnt they take off the major entertainment networks and things like that that's a remarkable feat it was it was obviously buoyed by the uh, election results but uh, with Megyn Kelly's departure, there may be a little bit of a fall off in 2017. That'll be hard for them to repeat. And they're going to have a very big hole to fill with Megyn's slot in the end. So, But who knows? Uh, Fox is still going to be the leader no matter what, at least uh, in cable news. And they've proven they could adjust to some stuff. So. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, that's it for the Bias Buzz. Thanks a lot. Apologize to those that are watching on Facebook. We had, it looks like we had a little bit of technical difficulty. But hopefully you got uh, most of the program. And uh, if not, catch us on YouTube. See you later.